Good morning, Grace Fellowship. How's everybody today? Good. We're good. I got to tell you, it's nice to be in 60 degree weather. <laughs> Man, um, left 103 in Austin and yeah, 60 is nice. <laughs> well, for um, when, when I f- first got out of seminary, my, my first role in, in pastoral ministry was in a college uh, community. So I was a college pastor at Texas Tech University, and uh, it was a really, it was a great gig. Um, uh, we had a little campus center right across the street from the university, so the church was a fairly large church, and they were very interested in reaching the campus, so they purchased this facility right across the street, and we, we had Friday night programs, we had a Sunday school program, we did services there, and it was a very active group of about 200 college students. And uh, when we were serving there, one of the things that tended to uh, occupy the attention, I know this will become as a real surprise for you, but what tended to occupy the attention of these students was relationships. That's all they wanted to talk about. Like, how do I know I found the right person? And then you have the relationship drama. This person's doing this and that person's doing that. Pastor, can you help me? And then invariably you also had some, um, I don't know how to say this nicely, but they were just kind of... Um, awkward people who were very, very needy, that um, their whole life seemed to revolve around uh, what kind of relationship they were in. So if they were in a good relationship, the world was amazing. Everything was great. But if they were not in a relationship or they were in a bad relationship, then everything was wrong in the world. And you know, they were depressed and sad and always tearful. And um, I think we probably all have known people like this, you know, the really needy ones that are waiting for that superhero to change their life forever. Well, we've been in a series called Close Connections. And in this uh, series, we've been looking at various people who had a close connection to Jesus. And you might even say that each one of them were looking for a superhero of sorts, a, a savior, if you will. But the one that we're going to be looking at today, I think, was particularly so. Her name is Mary Magdalene. And we're going to be looking at her life and asking the same two questions we've asked throughout the series. What does her story teach us about how faith works? And then what does it teach us about how God responds? So let's pray and we'll ask God to help us. With this, with this story, making it personal. Lord Jesus, thank you for our time together today. I am so grateful to be here and to be able to unpack this uh, somewhat controversial story of Mary Magdalene. And my prayer is, Lord, that you would allow us to be able to enter the story in a meaningful way and that if there is something you want to say to us through this story, Lord, we open up our own hearts and invite you to speak by your Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all who agreed said, Amen. Amen. I cannot live without passion. No, not the kind men pay for. Although, I've heard of the rumors. No, I've done a lot of things I'm guilty of, but not that. Now that Jesus healed me, I can touch grass and feel the hair of children and I can breathe deeply and I'm grateful for all of it. Jesus gave me my life back and I eat food with such relish that the disciples laugh at me. And I say, what are you looking at? And they say, Mary, no one enjoys food like you. And it's so. I fear someday I may get really fat. For years, I didn't have a life. I was a puppet for demons a slave to demons, whims, and passions, and desires. And I felt that darkness. 
I thought their thoughts and I acted on them. But when Jesus came, he cast out demons. Not one, not two, but seven. I was whole again. I was free. I could think my own thoughts. I could dream my own dreams. Can you imagine what a gift that is? I owe my life to him. I devote my life to serving this man who gave my life back to me. At the foot of the cross, I watched and I waited with the other women. With every nail that pierced Jesus, I could feel I swear I could feel the nails in my own hands. Those nails were killing me as effectively as they were killing him. I felt my life flicker. And when we laid his lifeless broken body in the tomb as best we could because it was Sabbath, I felt like a ghost of a woman. The fact a few days that his, later that his body disappeared didn't really surprise me. What surprised me was that my own body was solid enough to even cast a shadow. That's how much of a ghost I felt I was. In my grief, I wandered senselessly back to that tomb because I didn't know where to go or even what else to do. I was lost again. They say I cried, but I'm not aware of it. You have to feel alive to know you cried. When I saw him, I thought he was the gardener. But then he said my name. Have you ever known the wonder of someone you deeply love say your name and see you, really see you, and love you just the same? I hope each of you gets to hear Jesus say your name and really see you and know that you are loved just as you are. When I heard him say my name, I bowed at his feet. I said, Rabboni, Master, you are alive and I'm still Mary. And I can walk now in freedom. I was still learning way back then that nothing, nobody can take or destroy the life Jesus gives you. Never. And so those who know me <laughs> still say I'm possessed. And it's true. I'm possessed by the love of Jesus and my love for him. I am possessed by his passion, the passion for living and loving and being loved just as we are. I cannot live without passion. I cannot live without that. And I won't. That's beautiful. Normally when I start a message, I will say something to the effect of, 
Um, you know, I know you all have a busy week, you have a lot of things on your mind, but could you really just focus in today on your own life and may, you know, whatever the Lord may want to say to you, that you'll kind of stay focused in on that? Because it's easy to get distracted, isn't it? But today I want to start by saying, uh, I give you permission, not that you need it, but I give you permission to think about other people beside yourself who might need to hear what we're going to be talking about today. Because I believe this is one of those things that the world desperately needs to hear. And so there may be a sibling, a, a son or daughter, grandson, granddaughter, friend, neighbor, who needs to hear this word. And my hope is that as a result of our time together, you might have some new vocabulary to express one of the most important truths that we have in the Christian faith. And I think it comes to us through the story of Mary. Now, Mary was uh, quite a controversial figure. In fact, there's a lot of discussion about her, uh, partly because there were several Marys in the story and not everybody is given a, a, a last name. And so you're trying to figure out, well, is this Mary the mother of Jesus? Is this Mary Magdalene? Is this another Mary? Mary was a very common name, obviously, in the day. And so you have to do a little bit of sorting out. And, uh, and, and, and I'm, today, I'm going to try and help sort through some of the story of Mary um, in a way that would be helpful. Now, first of all, um, one of the introductions, if you will, to us of Mary, at least I think it is a story, it's related to Mary, is in Luke chapter 7, where we are introduced to her simply as the sinful woman. Um, it is the uh, account where, you know, Jesus is at a feast, a, a, a gathering of, of folks, and they're having dinner together, and this woman interrupts this gathering, and she does something truly outlandish. So she, she comes in, she takes some very expensive perfume, pours it on Jesus' head, and then wipes his, his feet with her hair and starts kissing his feet in the middle of a dinner, right? And she's just referred to in Luke chapter 7 as a sinful woman. Uh, and, 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 and I believe that it may have been Mary. Partly because as you read on in the book of Luke, from then on, from that story on, Mary is included in the disciples who are following Jesus. So it's like that story and then all of a sudden Mary appears in the Luke a gospel account from then forward. And then in John's account of that very same event at the dinner, uh, he actually names the woman as Mary. Now we're not sure if it's Mary Magdalene, but I think given some of the other things we know about her story, uh, I believe that was probably her. Now, I think um, it's plausible that it is Mary because she was obviously, I think, looking for a superhero given her background and her challenge. Now, the fact of the matter is there's a lot of stories about her background. Uh, thanks to Dan Brown, uh, he believed that Mary was the secret lover of Jesus and that they were sexually involved. Other scholars paint a much more a whitewashed version of Mary, that she was simply kind of an emotional woman uh, who was wealthy and had capacity to be of help to the ministry and support her. And so you have these two wide spectrums of belief about Mary, and I think it was somewhere in between, that, that Mary was uh, not as extreme as Dan Brown painted her to be, but not the whitewashed versions that many scholars want to suggest. The truth is that she was a woman with a past. Now, why can I say that for sure? Well, it was, was, as it was already illustrated in our little dramatic reading this morning, she was a woman who was delivered of seven demons. We read this in Luke chapter 8. Soon afterwards, Jesus began a tour of the nearby towns and villages, preaching and announcing the good news about the kingdom of God. And he took 12 disciples with him, along with some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases, and among them were Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. So it's just, this was a woman with a, a, a pretty uh, tainted past. And if we kind of look back at the, this, the account of Luke 7, when he was so lavishly loved on by this woman, it makes sense 
if you think about it as Mary, that she would be that extravagant with her love. Because the, je- the way that Jesus talked about her, he said, I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven, so she has shown me much love. The other reason that I think she, she really did have a, a somewhat tarnished and checkered past is not only because of the demonic activity, but because of her name itself. Uh, she was known as Mary Magdalene. Uh, in some of the ways, the same way that Jesus was known as Jesus of Nazareth. So Magdalene was a reference back to where she was from. And according to the Jewish Talmud, Magdala was uh, uh, just simply known as the city of sin. In other words, uh, to put it in the modern context, imagine her name being uh, Mary from the red light district in Amsterdam. Uh, she may not have been involved with it, but she might have been guilty by association, right? So she is painted in scripture as one who had a pretty tarnished story. Now, why do I go through such trouble to paint this as it was? Because I think one of the things, and this is one of the questions that we're going to kind of try and answer today, is what does the story of Mary teach us about how God works? And one of the things I think we have to kind of nail in the ground is that one of the things that Mary's story, maybe the most important thing that Mary's story teaches us, is that God loves people despite their checkered past. God loves people regardless of their past. Now, you know, if you've been around the church for any length of time, you, you're probably at this point like, okay, so he's going through all this whole thing. Ho-hum, I know that. Yes, God loves sinners. But don't discount it too quickly. I want, you to, encur- I want to encourage you to just kind of hang with me and feel the weight of it today. Because when we really see this, it is, it is one of the most beautiful things about the gospel, particularly as it relates to how Jesus sees Every single one of us, those of us with a very checkered past, people you know with a checkered past, he loves you. And once you make your commitment to him, he doesn't see your past anymore. It's done. It's over. It's under the blood. And that's exactly what Mary's story illustrates to us. Because I think what happens for many of us is when we think about our own life, or we think about other people's lives, we categorize sin, don't we? Like we have what we might call our minor sins. What are they? Well, you know, tell a white lie, miss church, swear, unless it's at church, eat the last chocolate chip cookie, or forget your anniversary, right? We would call these minor sins, although that last one's probably not a minor one. Probably need to move that to the other list, right? Major sins, what are they? Forgetting your anniversary. Drug abuse, theft, casual sex, murder. And I think most of us, even unintentionally, even subconsciously, once we know a person's story, we tend to categorize them. And we say, well, okay, yeah, yeah, you had your sin, but, you know, you didn't do the, the big ones. And Mary checked a number of the big ones. And so her life experience was that people judged her because of her past. But Jesus didn't. In fact, it's one of the most profound things. When you really stop and look at the way that Jesus treated Mary, it is true, unabashed love. Let me me illustrate this. Another story that tends to be associated with Mary is a a story found in Luke chapter 10. And again, it's not one where she is referenced by her last name, but I believe based on the study that we've done and some of the other things that we see in this particular story that this was Mary of Magdalene. And it's a story where uh, we were introduced to Mary's sibling, Martha. So in uh, in, in Luke chapter 10, Mary and Martha are together hosting Jesus at the house. And uh, you're probably familiar with the story, but Martha was busy in the kitchen getting things ready for the people that were gathering, and Mary had chosen to uh, not help her sister, but to instead sit at Jesus' feet. 
And you can imagine this happening, right? Like if Martha's in the kitchen and she's starting to, you know, hit the pans together, hinting at the fact that maybe there's some help needed uh, in the kitchen. Mary is totally, uh, you know, not paying attention. She stays there. And you can imagine, like, if this is Mary Magdalene, what's going on in Martha's mind? What's she really thinking? Now, I'm I'm taking a little bit of liberty with the story, but I can so see this. Martha's in the kitchen, and she's thinking, you know what, I'm so glad that my sister has gotten her stuff sorted, but this is exactly the problem with her. When stuff needs to get done, what is she doing? She's sitting in the other room, trying to be somebody different, When in fact, if she was really different, she'd be in there helping me. And she felt like she was justified in her position, right? Because she she comes to Jesus expecting to be affirmed. Jesus, can't you see that I'm here in the kitchen trying to get ready? And Mary, you know, the one with the past, is just sitting here like she always does. And what does Jesus say? That's what I love. You know, like if you see yourself in this story, it all of a sudden carries such new meaning, doesn't it? What does Jesus say? My dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details, but there's only one thing worth being concerned about. And Mary, the one with the past, has discovered it, and it won't be taken from her. Jesus was not looking at Mary like Martha was. There was not even a twinge of her, oh yeah, well, you know, she is that woman with the past. The other thing that's so striking to me about Mary is that Mary is the only person in all four Gospels, so in every account of Jesus' life, Mary is referenced as being at the two most important places of Jesus' life. So she is noted as being at the, at the crucifixion, first of all. So she was with Jesus, as we saw and heard in the drama today, when he was crucified. When others had left, she stayed. And then she was one of the first to come to the to the tomb to discover his resurrection. Now again, I want you to just stop and think about this because from a a natural or cultural perspective, this would not have been the way you would want to have written the story. Uh, Women were seen with a very different status back in that day. And if you wanted to make a compelling case about something being true, you would not entrust that story to a woman. It would not have been believed. But God arranged the circumstances of this story that Mary, the one with the past, was entrusted with the prompting to go visit the tomb, to be among the first to see the resurrected Lord. And it just makes me want to scratch my head. Why? Why would the Lord do that? Why would he like, write the story cross-culturally against the grain? Unless he wanted to communicate something vitally important. And that is that Jesus was not one who saw Mary as the one with the past. He saw Mary as the one who had been redeemed, who loved deeply, who had been forgiven much and therefore loved much, and therefore worthy of being trusted with this important assignment. And if that's Mary's story, how much more so can that be ours? Which leads me to the second question. 
What does this story teach us about what our own faith requires? It takes courage to believe that God can love a person with the past. It really does take courage to believe that God can love you deeply, without twinge, without regret, as a person with a past. Because here's how the thought process goes, doesn't it? I mean, for all of us, doesn't it go to some degree like this? I messed up a lot when I was a kid. And some of it not so much when I was a kid. And yes, God graciously forgave me. He made me new. And I'm thankful for that. But there are a lot better people with much less assorted past than I do, whom God must prefer, and therefore I'm going to be happy or I'm going to be content or I'm going to settle for where I am right now because this is probably as good as it's going to get. And there's something wonderful about being grateful, truly, right? So we are grateful for the past, you know, that God's forgiven us from our past. But it also, at some points, becomes a limiting factor for us, doesn't it? We let our past become the determining factor of what God can do with our lives. And we say, well, because it's, you know, because I've been here and I've done that and I've still messed up, I, you know, I just, I just need to be happy with this little piece. And, and maybe that is what it is. But don't put yourself in that place. A number of years ago, when I was pastoring in Columbia, Missouri, we, uh, we brought Brandon, Brandon Manning, uh, Brandon Manning into, a, into a church for a conference. And uh, some of you may know Brandon Manning. He's, he's got a, a really you know, interesting story. Um, he was a man with a past. And, uh, and he became a priest. And even as a priest, he had his struggles and challenges. But he was one of these guys who knew to the core of his being that he was deeply loved by Jesus. It's all he could talk about. In fact, one of my favorite quotes, and I'll close with this. We have been given God in our souls and Christ in our flesh. We have the power to believe where others deny. We have hope where others despair, to love where others hurt. This and so much more is sheer gift. It's not reward for our faithfulness, our generous disposition, or our heroic life of prayer. Even our fidelity is a gift. If we but turn to God, said St. Augustine, that itself is a gift of God. And this is my favorite part. My deepest awareness of myself is that I'm deeply loved by Jesus Christ and I have done nothing to earn it or to deserve it. After we heard Brennan Manning speak, we had a Q&A. And there was a, a young lady from our church who um, was a leader but also had quite, quite a story. And she asked Brendan Manning, she says, like, how can I make sure that this is true for me? Like, you sound like you so know it. Like, you're deeply loved by Jesus. And I can't believe I'm still here. Questioning whether or not he does. And I loved his response. It was, I don't know what to tell you, dear lady, on how to get it. But I do know this much. He does. He absolutely does. And that's what I want to say to you today as well. Perhaps you've been around the church for as long as you can remember. And maybe you still wonder... <laughs> 
given my story, given my past, given what I've done. I don't know. There's probably a whole lot of other people Jesus likes better than me. And I want to say the whole, in my opinion, the whole reason the story of Magda, Mary Magdalene is in the Bible is so that we would know for all of history that if he was willing to do what he did with Mary because of his great love for her, how much more? Would he be willing for us to know the same? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it sounds like such a basic idea. And, you know, for some of us who've been around the church, it's, it's just, we don't mean for it to be the case, but it's, it's just one of those things that can become um, a little dry and a little uh, familiar. And because of that, it, it, the, the depth of it can be lost on us. So my prayer today is that you would just bring it alive again in our lives, in our heart, that we would be able to appreciate afresh that no matter where we've been, no matter what we've done, if we entrust ourselves to you, the past is behind us. What you did on the cross forgives us. And we are deeply loved and known by you. And that changes everything. So make it fresh to us, I pray now, in Jesus' name. And all who agreed said, amen.